yes, outside pressure can have a different make a difference on the department. And one good way might be outside pressure on the city council. Hey, there's a note. It's got to yeah. be a suicide note. I'm the one who studied writing, and I say it's not a suicide note. You know, it's it's something else. It looks like two different things here. Didn't he just do the overdose? And so I'm going to introduce go to a, sleep. Uh, yeah. yeah. Do the overdose, go to sleep with a smile on his face. You go know? down into the garage where his stinking old Volvo was, turn on the key and shut the garage door and yeah. take the heroin. And he could have it all right there and it would have been painless. Right. Yeah. So I told Tom this that uh, when I was in school, um, all, all writing classes. One of them we read um, John Steinbeck's um, Dubious Battle, In Dubious Battle. And it's sort of like a follow-up or predecessor of um, well, what was famous, Grapes of Wrath. And it's Okies, they're uh, out there, there's union trouble on the orchards, and there's a guy with kind of red commie leanings who's trying to organize the unions uh, uh for the pickers uh and he gets killed and when they kill him they shoot him in the face with a shotgun which screams overkill yeah. and so i i asked the professor what was that you know because a lot of times the professors will let you come to your own conclusions but this one he took a moment he said they wanted to erase his identity be no open casket he won't be a hero he won't be you know they won't be parading his body around town or anything like that it's uh so they erase his identity and i thought it kind of looks like what happened not that anybody that killed kurt was literate but the same kind of thinking like let's shoot him his head his head will explode it didn't and mm -hmm. there won't be an open casket and he can't be a hero well i can think of one person that fits pretty Mm. particularly if they're going yeah. through force and uh but i and then he's cremated within the week yeah well, there's, she did not want him to you know be an idol uh pretty mad well whoever did it was pretty mad at him is what i read much, I more, creates... much more than a somebody with a, a debt he, he owes me two hundred dollars or yeah. anything like that this is somebody like in, in homicides um Often where it involves lovers, and I, right now I'm thinking of gay lovers, you might find several stab wounds, like 40 or 50. It's rage. Mm -hmm. uh, this looks more like a rage. And the rage is because of the passion that had been there at one time. And I think this is what you see with the shotgun blast to the face. It's rage. She's, somebody, I keep saying she, but somebody was really mad at him and didn't quite go to plan, but it was very effective. But I think the heroin would have done him in. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's interesting because if we look at the scene as a whole, there are so many inconsistencies with the crime scene itself. But yeah. exactly as you're, you're pointing out, it's overkill. Everything about it, from the perspective of the media, it goes down as this massive, you know, this big myth, and it just creates so much more drama and everything around it as a story. I also think that element of rage, you know, especially if someone's facing a divorce, yes. um, you know, it, it's. There's no way, in my opinion, and I'm going to say Courtney here, would really allow Kurt to move on, in my opinion, with another partner, especially with their child. It really would have, she would have lost so much credibility in terms of her fame and notoriety. And I think it really sullies his character in his name. And she's done a very good job in the press of really soiling his character, making him out to yeah. be a weak person and things like that. And so I think yeah. that really, when we look at elements of this, it really... To me, it's quite obvious, but I appreciate obviously that's the, the official narrative is somewhat different. So, oh. yeah. Yeah. And so I went from accepting the probable cause of my, mm -hmm. you know, based on what my fellow officers and detectives had told me. Oh, I was thinking you might want to talk to me about what I learned from talking to the real guys that were there. Um, mm -hmm. So I switched my opinion to no, I got to look at this more carefully. You know, what would I tell a chief now if I was briefing him on this? 
say, chief, you need to, you know, put the cold case guy back on it and, or somebody that's a little more open-minded and yeah. help them work this. Uh, let me ask you a one-line question here. <laughs> I think I like you, you, I think you've, pretty made, you've pretty much made it clear, but I, I want to just come right out and ask you. Captain Lowe, do you believe Kurt Cobain committed suicide? I do not. I think the web evidence is overwhelmingly uh, supports that he could not have done all the things that they attribute to him, given what you see at the where his body was found. And again, I, I did not like the note to start with. I think it was planted. And I, I think somebody else wrote it. I'd like to see the original. Um, yeah, no, I don't think it was suicide. Okay. Mm -hmm. I also think it's quite interesting. You you mentioned there about we know that it would have taken multiple doses to reach that level of 1.52 milligrams per liter. And it's interesting, we know when cooking heroin, you need water. Now, yes, there was a sink in the greenhouse. We don't know if that was functioning. But again, you know, if we look at where the body was found, was he constantly going back and forth to the sink to get water? You know, it's all these these tiny details. I know it's not a case of something that will stand up in court and prove something one way or another, which I know obviously Tom's a big fan of and like you would be. But it's when we piece all these things together, it's just so inconsistent. It just doesn't make sense, quite right. simply, when we look right. at the and, basic facts. Well, another thing about his body, and uh, Tom and I talked about this, uh, I was in the Navy, and there's not always a chair where you want to sit down when you can catch a break. And I, I don't know anybody that just sits down in the middle of the floor and goes crisscross applesauce. And in the Navy, because maybe the ship is moving, you sit with your back to a wall if you can. And I'm thinking if I was in the shed, I would have probably been sitting up on the table with my back to the wall and my feet up on the counter. Mm -hmm. uh, it's I think that's kind of a primal thing. It gets you up above where the things that can crawl on the ground forget at you so i think you would naturally elevate yourself if you were sitting and have your back against something not out in the middle of the floor that just didn't make sense and then back to was it mcnamara the doctor back to what the doctor said Archorn? nicholas no, no, the one the note you sent accompanying that oh i don't recall i oh yeah. I, I have it written down but i won't yeah, waste I think that but the doctor's happen. opinion and i think it was from london i thought he made some good sense about the hair, you know, like if the hair is fanned out, that would indicate he didn't just fall back. Well, I don't have hair, so I can't demonstrate it. <laughs> but if it's fanned out, that would indicate he was probably dragged and his pants were pulled up a little bit, which means he's either carried or he was dragged. And uh, they didn't think to pull that back down, but they did think to after he did all that heroin to button up his shirt. Okay, yeah. I feel that arthritic. This is not easy for me, so. Yeah. I don't I don't see Kurt doing that. Well, interestingly, I find as well what we've learned in the autopsy report is in the crease of one arm, he had that band-aid which had a cotton swab beneath it, which says to me he likely had just had a blood test perhaps before leaving rehab. That 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 makes yeah. a lot of sense. That's where, yeah. that, that's the people that would do it. Yeah. And so I'm thinking, it's not in my opinion, there's no way he'd be walking around town or at home for several days after he returned home with that still stuck on his arm. That would oh. that would just be annoying. I mean, it would make sense to me. He was also still wearing the medical bracelet, which isn't here nor there. But I just feel personally this indicates he died closer to returning home than it did than he did on April 5th, in my oh. opinion. That that could be. Uh, of course it's all theory, but um I have a, a blood thing that I have to have uh, have phlebotomies like two or three a year. And uh, so I have the needle sticks often and they're because of diabetes, they're checking me for uh, my blood sugar and whatnot. And uh, sometimes I've looked over there and it's, it's there, but then I swim every other day. So I'm likely to pull that off, but it's like, why is that still there? <laughs> but, when you've got cotton that, underneath, yeah. It, it got, you don't keep it on for long. And I I, th I think that the little one would come off pretty easy, you know, like the blood test. You know. Yeah, I, I I removed mine probably within 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, even, well, even when they, they'll they say, well, leave that on for, for another hour or so, because I'm on blood thinners and 
they don't yeah. want to bleed but i i just i can't stand having it on so i take it off pretty quick um, depends on what i'm doing i usually forget about it yeah mm -hmm. do you believe that there are people within the seattle police department who possibly might feel enough pressure sooner or later to have the case at least change from suicide to undetermined okay you know as i was starting to tell you earlier about outside influences on the department that shape my training, shape the promotions tremendously, shape the way we do business uh, uh, within the department. Yes, outside pressure can have a different, make a difference on the department. And one good way might be outside pressure on the city council, if uh, which is, it, it went way wonky and now it's coming back to more normal, the pendulum swing. And if you appeal to the more normal ones, they might call over to the chief and say, hey, my constituents want to know what really happened here. What's your thoughts on pressure from the media? I've always mm -hmm. believed that that's where the real pressure comes from. When when people like Dateline or 60 Minutes or somebody like that, they come in there and they sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one interview with somebody, a spokesperson from the Seattle Police Department, and they start going over these questions and how did you conclude this based on that and that? And why did you say this here? And then you said that there. That's the first thing on my page on, on the website, CobainCase.com, is just item by item. I can imagine a, a, a reporter questioning somebody from the Seattle Police Department and going right through that, that list item by item. And how could you conclude suicide? Yeah, and it's so obvious it was not investigated properly. Right, it, it wasn't investigated, and maybe I should explain that. Um, homicide uh, protocol is they don't investigate suicides because mm -hmm. there is no suspect that's outstanding. It is a crime to kill yourself, but the suspect is there. He's the one that did the killing. So they doesn't require their expertise. That's why they say, I'm, we're not going to do it. Um, but they leave that for patrol officers to do, which was done in this case, or they'll supervise it. Well, again, why didn't you bag the hands? Why didn't you collect trace of evidence? Why didn't you examine the hand for blowback? Or they didn't do that. Um, so that's the protocol. But so they probably tried to stick to that as close as they could. We're not going to investigate the suicide. It's not sexy. There's, we're not going to get our name in a newspaper for solving this really difficult case because it's this, it's not a case. And so in, in 1997, I'm, I think you're, you're probably aware, you're, the spokesperson for Seattle Police Department said, and we have this on video, he told Unsolved Mysteries uh, when they did a show on this case, he said, our our officers actually investigated this case as a possible homicide. I'm not sure where he got his information, but <laughs> I have been on the top floors enough to watch pre-interview briefings. And if you're asked this, what do you think? What do you ask this? What do you have? This? And you have an attorney in the room coaching you through uh, how to deal with these questions. And, so he was probably told this is what we're going to say, but doesn't have it on his own knowledge. But I see, uh, well, come on. I talked to Joe Fuel and uh, Von Lewandowski. Uh, we might, we'll talk about that right now, if that's okay. Sure, yeah. Um, Von worked for me. I was the Metro commander. He was um, a Harbor commander at work for me. Um, and... Um, he was down dropping off something and I said, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm looking into this and I'm thinking about a book and whatnot. He said, oh, you can't get me to write about it. You can't get me to talk about this. I won't talk about this. They tried to fly me to London. I will not talk about this. 45 minutes later, Nikki, I am still taking notes on what he's telling me. He's like, that's really good inside information. But uh, Joe uh, Fuel is actually the one that took the camera roll films and he and i discussed that um they shouldn't be developed and that would have been my early advice to the chief and then later joe says you know that film's going to deteriorate if we don't 
develop mm -hmm. it, so maybe we should develop it. We, my department, had concerns that if it had been developed, it might disappear out of the evidence locker and end up on the National Enquirer. And so we thought, well, that's not fair to occur to the family. But then uh, as we moved it around, we had concerns about a certain employee that didn't have the highest integrity issues um, or reputation for integrity and in that it was really under her control. So that's when it was developed is let's get this done and we'll have the prints. And then, you know, we'll, if it gets out to the Empire, we'll, we'll deal with that. But, um, okay. Captain, what about the officers, you know, the sergeants, the lieutenants who worked under your command or even those you interacted with from other divisions? Did you get along with all those people? Did you get along with everyone in general? No, that's not the nature of my business, <laughs> <laughs> nor nor my constitution. Um, oh. oh well, probably my bigger issue came with uh, two different sergeants I had when I was a lieutenant, and uh, one I knew was stealing time from the city, and he ran a sloppy roll call. He didn't make his officers show up on time, and he had chronic tardiness and. He just was not supervising. He wanted to be their best friend. So I jumped in his shorts big time and he retired. Um, then when I was the juvenile commander, I had another sergeant who also was like that. He would let the uh, detectives come in when they wanted. And then he had personal business he took to care of early and he would leave. And then I found that, wait a minute, the the requirements are that we staff the office till five. There was nobody in that office after three thirty, so I jumped on his shorts and he retired. <laughs> so uh, I see them both at retired officers' banquets. They don't come up and say hello, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, it, it, but it's funny. I saw another one, uh, an officer who um, I had to deal with officially, but it, there was no personal animosity there i was the commander of internal affairs and his name came up office often and we're shaking hands and good buddies and what in fact he broke my nose uh in pickup basketball <laughs> but that it just never occurred to me to be mad at him or for him to be mad at me uh it was funny but um now other distrust oh i can think about uh I have to be careful with this. A lieutenant who ran a shop that we might be interested in, and I did not like his management style. He was extremely permissive, and I've had detectives who work for him who say, you know, at a certain time of the night after they went out and gathered the evidence, they'd get out the scotch bottle and put it on the desk and pour themselves a shot. And Mr. Teetoler didn't do anything about it. And I, the heck, you know, what? <laughs> what kind of message are you sending here? And this is the same group that went up to the Cobain place and the certain San a sergeant, I just assume not mention his name, but you know who it is. Big guy. Um, I had tried to take a couple of uh, cases to him, give him tips on what I knew to be suspects. One was in a homicide and I was right. And one was a robbery way back when he was a robbery surgeon and he blew me off each time. Turns out I'm, well, we don't know about the robbery one because nobody worked it. Uh, but the homicide one, it did come back around. It was the suspect I had told him it was. And uh, so I was not overly awed by his um, domineering, forceful personality. I mean, he's this much bigger than me. And, uh, you know, just this is the way it is. And we're not, we're not going to spend any time on that. And um, he was the one at the scene. And I think he bought into or drove that it's a suicide yeah. and i think yeah. he i think even the, the, the lieutenants because one of them was that guy the, the one that was too soft and squeezy and let him drink uh I, they just accepted what he said you know yeah. and uh where, where's the rigorous examination there was none you know they just went with oh let's, hey, there's a note it's got to yeah. be a suicide note i'm the one who studied writing and i say it's not a suicide note you know it's it's something else it looks like two different things here and i was just going to ask actually you, you touched on that nicely in relation to the cobain case knowing that it was never investigated properly was never treated as a homicide it was very much written on the as we're here on the scene this one on the scene of a suicide 
How do you feel about that? And how do you feel about internal corruption? Well, hmm. well, let me mention that same sergeant. Within the year, he and one of his detectives, one of his detectives went up to, uh, I think it had been an officer involved shooting. And uh, as they're searching the scene, there's like a cabin and he opens the door and there's some cash. Well, he starts loading the cash into a bag or something and Floyd Steiger's there and says, what are you doing? And he said, well, you want some of this? Well, you didn't put that back. No, we don't. <laughs> no. So, you know, the sergeant, Cameron, uh, asked me uh, Cameron, to keep an eye on you. Oh, of all people. Yeah, and let, let him know how you were working out. And I'd already heard a story from somebody else who was at a crime scene where money disappeared off a table. And uh, of course he didn't report it. He was brand new at the time, but he saw the money. And then when I, I audited that case too, when I saw the pictures, there's no money on the table. There's not now when the pictures are taken, but there was when I got to the scene, it was like, Oh my God, my department. And uh, yeah. So Cameron's name is in a lot of those situations. Uh, yeah. Where and so Stamper made it clear he was going to fire uh, Cameron the year of Cobain's death because that's when that other money thing came up and they were trying to seek charges on him, but the, there was the prosecutor declined to file on him, but did on Sonny Davis and um, yeah, it kind of made you wonder. Well, Cameron was in a position to know a lot of stories. And maybe he had some stories on whoever officially declined to charge him. Yeah. Uh, Actually, I'd like to read um, a little portion of the toxicology report, interestingly, up here, under opinion. Uh, and I think this just fits in very nicely, where it says, in view of the scene and circumstances surrounding his death, the manner of death is classified as suicide. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and while you have it right there can you read the line about um the suicide note yeah yeah so again there's an indication here isn't there so let me just pull that up a note indicating intent or suicidal intent rather was found in the residence yeah okay and what is their qualifications for determining if that was exactly written by him and that they decide it was a note, but mm. what makes it a suicide note? I never did see in there that he said, I'm going to kill myself because I suck or this life sucks. Or I never yeah. saw it. I really believe that line was put in the autopsy report to throw off anybody that might come along to review the autopsy yeah, report. Sure. And when they see that, they're not necessarily given the copy of the note along with the autopsy report to review, but they see that line and that's just a clear cut yeah. suicide note at the scene, you know, indicating intent to kill himself. And I mean, how, how big of an influence is that going to have on their opinion, no matter what they take out of the autopsy report? I think yeah. it takes a whole investigation. Uh, or lack of investigation. Yeah. And as well here, I mean, it's just this wording to me is preposterous. And circumstances surrounding his death. That's nothing about that has anything to do with the medical positioning here of what determines someone's manner of death, which is in the toxicology report uh, and the, sorry, the autopsy report. Again, it's all just, it's all what they've been fed. It's all this surrounding narrative that has led them to this conclusion. You know, there's, well, certainly, sort of a tangent but it's it's related to this uh at least from interpreting writing uh in this country nina we have um different school districts will say we're going to ban this book we're going to ban that book and and it, i look at it as like well i've read almost all of them i'll we'll have to go out and get the rest and um and, and i'm i puzzling over this i thought who is driving this uh who are uh, do they have a background in writing or literature like I do, or are they trained? A anyways, my my argument is, I think you shouldn't be able to ban a book unless you have um, have some expertise in reading or, you know, and or writing and, and know what you're talking about. Because I thought, God, I could be up there. And I, I, I appealed questions on the captain's exam before, and I realized, 
ooh, I know more than they do about this subject. <laughs> I don't know that I can convince them, educate them enough to let them know that they're wrong. Uh, kind of the Dunning-Kruger effect. They don't know what they don't know. And anyways, I think that applies here. I'd like to go on actually and ask you, now I appreciate if you don't want to name names at this point and you are writing a, a follow-up to Crazy Love. Yeah. Do you have a list of persons of interest in relation to the Cobain case? <laughs> Oh, okay. I really have to be careful there. Yeah. But you don't have to name names. Just okay. The, but you, can but you know who I'm going to talk about. If I have <laughs> yeah, personality. Oh, I might want to pursue what the lead guitarist was doing up here during that exact same time. And it was also at Kristen Paff's place. Yeah. I think he would be an ex extremely interesting person to talk to yeah. and Allie I would like the one that showed you around I'd no, like no, Dylan Dylan showed you around yeah. yeah I would I would like to have them go in front of a grand jury and uh have a, a prosecutor that's prepared to ask them questions uh interview them under oath you know about what they were doing and where they were at and well for that matter I would like Courtney too but I don't see that happening but um yeah I would particularly like to have those two dylan and eric <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah those are, and and in my book my fiction novel because i have to be careful i brought i introduced a third person at that that lake scene the stabbing and whatnot but um uh that was just to bring a resolution to my novel but uh and your That's, sequel yeah a sequel that, with this yeah we might since uh gillespie's dead now i might um might focus back on the large search <laughs> a lot <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and well, it, that's not going to go well with my my fellow cops like you don't tell stories out of school you know that yeah, yeah. well i'm retired you know maybe this one needs to be told yeah yeah and with Crazy Love, what has inspired you to now follow this up with a true crime version of this? Certainly not my uh, publisher. <laughs> <laughs> I love Kristen dearly, but um, she is wonderful. It was her idea to write this in the first place. She, uh, you know, did the pretty please. You got nothing to do. You're divorced. You know, do this. And then I, I, I hit it and I thought, you know, if I don't find anything here, I'm not going to write a, a book just to because I'm bored, uh, I'll find something else to write about. And then, um, wow, I thought, well, she's onto something here. And so I, I started writing it, but she is really afraid of, of Courtney and company suing her, suing me, and su suing Tom some more. She's never sued anybody got to sue Tom. associated with me. Yeah, because you're such a troublemaker. <laughs> uh, that um, it, it was looking at that, that, well, on the back of my um, Crazy Love is uh, Ann Brimner, who's a noted attorney. You might have even seen her because she does international work, big cases. So uh, it might be worth a billable hour to to chat with her about repping me if I get the big lawsuit. So I'm kind of waiting for a someday I know will be in my corner and and, and uh, has got some way way well. I was. Got some big muscles uh, that can back me up if, because I don't have the money to contend with a lawsuit. But so Captain that's well, Captain Lowe. Let's yeah. hope. Let's hope for a big lawsuit. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, because you want to see her get yeah. deposed, and yeah. that's actually what. Uh, and I'll uh, find I'll find the book. money for you if it happens. <laughs> all right. <laughs> and, uh, I did. I talked to another chief prosecutor down in the Sacramento. We just have to be passing through there, and he said, "Hey, you know, as long as you're telling the truth." That's the best defense against right. this. Everything I said is true or I fix it, except for the very ending of my book. I mean, that's quite clearly fiction. But the all the other parts of it in the beginning are what I saw. And I tried to correct all the things I saw that were wrong on the Internet. I am a police captain. And as I told my publisher, if I don't see the evidence there, I'm not going to write a story. You know, I'd like her to explain that in front of a grand jury. Mm -hmm.